Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we could begin. Uh, this is a program on constitutional government, and our uh, guest uh, today is Jonathan V. Last, who's a senior writer at the Weekly Standard. Uh, he's written for many other uh, important publications, some of them uh, sort of conservative, you might say. And this is his uh, first book uh, called What to Expect When No One's Expecting. So it's on the demographic question, a question uh, of great importance and uh, I think uh, of great importance much underestimated. So uh, Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you and I see you have a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? I've sort of come down here with a little bit of a cold and so my voice is not normally this this deep and sexy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, can you, in all seriousness, no, can you guys like hear me and basically understand what I'm saying? Uh, okay, well, throw something at me if you can't. Uh, so thank you so much for having me here, Professor Mansfield. I have been a fan of Professor Mansfield since I was 14 or 15. Uh, I would occasionally cage glimpses of National Review, and uh, I, I've somehow managed to avoid being in your orbit up until this point, and uh, I'm now happily drawn in. Um, so, uh, so when I started writing this book, uh, when, I, when I started writing this book, uh, I had one kid and he was two weeks old. When I turned in the manuscript uh, and we went to press, I had three children. Um, so it took a long time. In the, in the middle of the process, my, my oldest kid, Cody, would uh, every day when I came home from work would ask me, did you finish writing the book yet, Dad? Did you finish writing the book yet, Dad? And, uh, and you know, every day I would say, no, no, buddy, I didn't, I didn't finish it. So I, I come home one day, and Cody, like lots of little boys, has this, you know, special object of love. It's a blanket. Uh, unlike many boys, his special object of love uh, has been really anthropomorphized to an amazing degree. Uh, she has a gender. She has a she. Her name is Beatty. Uh, I can't explain the name. And BD has a rich interior life. And so I come home from, from work one day, and Cody says, did you finish, reading the book? Did you finish writing the book, Dad? And I, I said, no, buddy, I didn't. He sort of stops, and he looks at me and goes, well, BD finished writing her book today. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I took this manfully, and I, I said, well, you know, I'm really proud of BD because writing a book is really hard. And this did not satisfy him. He, he looked at me, he sort of cocked his head to the side, and he says in his eyes, this mixture of like accusation and baleful disappointment, and he goes, it was hard especially because she does not have arms, <laughs> but she finished it anyway. Uh, and so I redoubled my efforts and, and wrote this thing. Uh, so, I mean, you may have noticed the world around us is strange. We live in a strange place. When, when Cody was, was a baby, we lived in this wonderful little close-in suburb of Washington called Old Ten Alexandria, uh, where people made a fetish of pets, and particularly dogs. Uh, you know, Old Town had all of these, you know, organic dog bakeries and pet fancy boutiques. Uh, and as I started working on the book and looking around and saying, was this, you know, is this just Old Town or is this elsewhere? It really is the whole culture. Uh, we have, we now have auto insurance that covers dogs. We have health insurance policies for dogs. Uh, we have actually changed, you may or may not know this, uh, changed a state law so that dogs can now inherit trusts and you can provide for, for Fido. Uh, in Old Town, the people who, you know, who go vacationing, they have these amazing kennels where they leave the, the dogs off. And one in Dogtown, USA, which is you know, particularly beloved by the people in Old Town, every dog has their own house. And, you know, in the house, it looks like a real house. And inside, there's like a flat screen TV, and there's a bed. And it's not a doggy bed, it's a person bed. And they have like tile work on the walls with intricate patterns and stuff. Uh, and it, you really can't believe it. And, uh, and I come upon yesterday uh, this, which is an advertisement for Yaf Bar, which is the world's first power bar for you to share with your dog like, while you're out. Dog, I mean, it's, you really you can't believe these sorts of things. Uh, and so we had this big fight in Washington. The Washington Post covered it in the, the Lincoln Park neighborhood on Capitol Hill. And uh, Lincoln Park was it's southeast, and it was gentrifying, and it was gentrified first by the sort of you know the childless couples who move in with their dogs, and they took it over, and then gradually some some couples moved in, and they had a baby, and there was a big big conflict in the park, the park that's the center of the square, between the dog owners and the parents, about who really has right of the space, and 
So, you know, the post style section covered this. It was really, really sort of nasty, go back and forth between these neighbors. And uh, the post quotes one of the dog owners saying, uh, you know, these parents with their children think that they own the whole place. What we need is a small fenced in area of the park for the children to run around in. <laughs> which is exactly the opposite of, you know, where we used to be. Uh, and so all of this is to say that, you know, our, our attitudes towards children have changed a great deal over the course of the last 40 years or so. So I, we'll get to that. In, that's a, the, sort of the big question about our attitudes toward children. But just very briefly, I'm going to jump to like 30,000 feet and give you the brief tour of demographics. Uh, and that's what the PowerPoint is for. And then we'll sort of push the, the slides off to the side and you don't have to worry about them anymore. Um, so everything we know about demographics in the popular mind is wrong, basically. Uh, you know, we are still sort of living in a world colored by the writings of Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb in 1968. Uh, the Population Bomb predicted fertility rates were increasing asymptotically. Population was increasing asymptotically. Uh, hundreds of millions of people were going to starve to death within just a, a handful of years, he said. Uh, and he was wrong. He was, I mean, not just wrong, but he was wrong at the moment when the exact opposite was happening. Beginning in 1968, fertility rates in the industrialized world started falling off the table. Uh, and so this is, what we're looking at here is by continent. We're looking at fertility rate decline. And you can see where everybody is headed. Uh, so beginning in the industrialized world, by 1973, all first world countries are below the replacement rate in fertility. Uh, demographers spend the next 10 or 15 years trying to figure out what it is about uh, modern industrialized life that causes people to go below replacement fertility. And while they're studying that, fertility decline then spreads into the developing world. Uh, so, you know, you have it all throughout Asia, all throughout the Middle East, all throughout Central and South America, and even through most of Africa as well. Uh, the result of all this being that when we look at population projections, uh, this is the United Nations, most people think that we are going to peak sometime in the next 50 years or so, around 9 billion or so, uh, and then we're going to start declining. And that is because uh, in 1979, the global fertility rate was 6. Uh, today, it's 2.5. Uh, and that is an amazing, amazing rate of decline in just about a generation and a half. Uh, now, this is, this is pretty interesting. 97% um, of the world's population lives in a country where the fertility rate is declining. And so at this point, you know, the real outliers are a few countries, uh, Afghanistan is one, a couple countries in sub-Saharan Africa, which have so far resisted, and nobody quite knows why. And the 2.5 that we're seeing now, we don't believe that this is the floor. This is sort of a way station as everybody is following in decline. Uh, so when I, when I talk about uh, the fertility rate, you guys all know what I mean. I'll, I'll just give you the brief definition anyway. So the fertility rate is a sort of mathematical construct of the average number of children that the average woman in a society has over the course of her life. Uh, to maintain replacement, to keep your population stable, your fertility rate needs to be 2.1. If you are above that, population grows. If you're below that, population uh, population contracts. We've been below replacement rate in America since about 1973. Uh, and so we are right now in the United States about 1.93. Uh, and the truth is that's actually not bad, uh, particularly among first world countries. That's actually very, very good. We're either first or second highest, depending on where the French are uh, in any given year. Um, so if we thought that 1.93 was sustainable, uh, then we really wouldn't worry about it in America. We'd say, we, we'll be OK. Everything's OK. We have lots of immigration. Uh, but the, most demographers think that 1.93 is actually not sustainable in the long term, uh, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Uh, when you break our 1.93 down, though, it, it looks a little bit less reassuring. So this is middle class fertility in America. And we, we will very crudely define middle class as white women who have graduated from college. Um, it's 1.6. That's very different. Uh, and to give you a sense as to how, how low 1.6 really is, uh, think about China for a moment. China has the one-child policy. It's been in place since 82. Uh, really coercive stuff. I mean, you know, forced abortions, forced sterilizations. If you have a kid without getting permission, you can lose your job. They can raise your home. Uh, in China, the fertility rate is 1.54. So our middle class is like six-tenths of a kid above China with, with the one-child policy. Now, the reason we care about the middle class is because most of the research on this suggests that throughout history, in all places and all times, fertility rates are aspirational. So it is the, the upper middle and middle class which leads everybody else in fertility. And so right now, our 1.93 is largely the product of immigration, which is great. But the problem is the immigrants we get uh, come in with very elevated fertility levels and very, very quickly start regressing to the mean. And so the concern is, 
if middle class fertility is so low and then recent immigrant fertility rushes back to the mean, how sustainable is 1.93 over time? Uh, and the answer is, is probably not. So the question then is why do we, why do we care? Um, we care about losing bodies. We care about shrinkage, I guess, a little bit. But that's not really what worries us. Um, you know, if we could lop off, if we could lop off 5% of the population across the board, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. The problem is that as you have a low fertility rate, over time, the age structure of your population shifts. So this is what I want to show you here. So this is Japan in 2000. Let me tell you what you're looking at here. On the, the left side of the graph, we have blue, the blue are the boys, excuse me, the uh, red on the other side of the girls, the pink are the girls. What we're looking at are five-year bands, the cohorts, you know, zero to four. The bigger the band, the more people there are in it. So this is Japan in 2000, this is Japan in 2013, and this is Japan in 2050. This is why we worry about low fertility rates. Low fertility rates give you an age profile that looks like this. Uh, and this is hugely unsustainable for all the reasons that you can probably guess very quickly, right? Uh, you wind up, just sort of in macroeconomic terms, uh, consumption winds up uh, decreasing. Old people consume less of everything except for health care. Uh, capital pools wind up shifting because old people invest their money very differently. They have shorter time horizons. They actually are not amenable to risk. In many cases, they actually take savings and draw them down. Uh, in innovation-based economies like us, most innovations tend to come from people between the ages of 20 and 40. As those cohorts shrink, you actually have a smaller pool of, innovat of innovators to, uh, to, to draw from. And then you have the welfare state which is the big problem in all of this. You know, how sustainable is the welfare state programs, which we have really constructed throughout the first world, uh, when you have big, big, top-heavy populations like this? Uh, let me just give you an, an, anecdote. So, an anecdote. Last year, uh, the Japanese sold more adult diapers than diapers for kids for the first time. And it's going to be like that from here on to the horizon for them, uh, because this is, this is the permanent structure of their population. Now, Japan is, you know, they're the first lemming off the cliff here. Uh, they are the, the worst case scenario, really. Uh, they are one of the first countries to experience massive fertility decline, and they have zero immigration, basically. So this is, they are worse off than us by, you know, orders of magnitude. Uh, however, we're all basically on the same curves, and one of the reasons we're concerned about this is because since fertility decline has become a worldwide phenomenon, you're going to see countries trying to grapple with the problems that an age uh, shift like this gives them in rapid succession. You know, first in the East, then spreading West into, into the Europe and the Middle East, then finally into, over to us and to South America. And I think you can see without, you know, look, the world doesn't have to become Mad Max, and maybe it won't, and I hope it won't, but you can see how this sort of stresses stability. It stresses, you know, stable political and economic orders. Uh, and, you know, so this is... This is America, then. I'll, we'll just run through America real quick. So here's us 1980. Here's us today. Uh, you can see how, you know, I have circled basically the big, big parts of that, which are immigrants. And without them, we look a lot more like Japan than we would have otherwise. Uh, and this is where we're going to be in 2035, which is essentially what Florida's age structure, just as a state, looks like today. Just the whole country will basically be built the way Florida is. Uh, so. You know, when we talked about entitlements, uh, so show, these are, this is the ratio of uh, workers to retirees for Social Security. We're at three right now. Uh, within the next 20 years or so, we'll be down to two. doesn't sound like that big of, a, big of a drop, three to two, but what it really means is a 50 percent increase on the tax burden for the remaining two workers if you're going to keep, uh, if you're gonna keep your, your benefits constant. So this is, you know, when we have all these big entitlement fights with Paul Ryan and, you know, what we're going to do with Medicare and all that, like, this is really actually the, the tectonic plates that are undergirding all of those. Uh, and, you know, you, you guys, many of you, some of you maybe not, but most of you will remember the 1980s when Japan was taking over the world. And, you know, Time and Newsweek would, you know, twice a year run covers about how in the year 2000, if you wanted to have a job in America, you were going to have to learn how to speak Japanese. Uh, <laughs> Well, so in the middle of the 1980s, uh, Japanese demographers were writing white papers and trying to, you know, wave white flags saying, you know, hey, look at this, look at this, this is, we have real problems. Look at our fertility rate, look at the coming age structure of the population. Uh, our economic growth is not sustainable. We have big, serious problems ahead. Nobody listened to them. Uh, and then they went into the lost decade. And so this is, you know, the, the, in two graphs, this is what China really, look, or what Japan really looks like here. Um, what we're looking at here is, you know, nominal GDP growth by the ratio of young people to old people. And you see as that ratio keeps dropping, GDP growth keeps dropping. And this is public debt then, 
by ratio of old people to young people. It makes sense, right? You, you wind up spending much more public, public monies because you have this entitlement system. You have to pay out to all these old folks. Uh, and debt keeps rising and rising and rising. Uh, and it coincides with what is, we're now in year 23 of Japan's lost decade. Most of the people over there, most of the demographers and economists, uh, there's general agreement that this is basically a demographic recession that they're mired in, and they don't really know how to get out of it. Uh, and so this is, this is the real concern, you know, and so this is, this is the slide we just looked at, 2050. So but I've, what I've done is I've circled two cohorts here, uh, you know, birth to 10-year-olds and then 70 to 80-year-olds, and look at the size of those two cohorts, the relative sizes. Uh, this is what concerns us. This is the danger ahead uh, for everybody in a certain way, uh, because, again, as you can see, this just isn't sustainable. So, uh, so with the, you know, the, the doom and the very bad things behind us, the question then becomes, how did we get here? And that is, to a large extent, what the book is about. It's about trying to suss out you know, the causes and, and how we wound up in this, in this pickle. And it's, it's really it's very complicated, as you might imagine, because there's this giant constellation of factors at work, some of which are very bad developments, some of which are very good developments. Uh, and so you know, like the, the number one cause in all this is the decline in infant mortality over the last 200 years. This is a great thing, right? Nobody would lament the decline in infant mortality, because now it used to be if you wanted to have seven kids alive, you had to have 12 or 13, and 12 or 13 of them. And now you can have three kids or two kids or one kid and be almost certain that they're going to survive into adulthood. This is a very good thing. Uh, we have uh, education, the increasing access of education. Um, I would argue that we've probably gone a little bit crazy with higher education in America today over the last 15 years or so. But on the whole, over the course of, you know, again, the long picture, the last 150 years or so, increasing education is a very good thing. I think an unalloyed good. Uh, yet that has driven down fertility rates um, because education always and everywhere tends to, to dampen fertility. Uh, and then there's urbanization. This is actually, you can see this uh, in data going back even to the 1800s. Uh, the more densely people live, the lower their fertility rates tend to be. Um, even, even if the density is not the density that we think of today with like, you know, Manhattan or San Francisco. Uh, and so as we've become increasingly urbanized, uh, that has also been a pressure pushing fertility downward. Uh, now this is not insidious. This is not a bad thing in, in any real way, I don't think. Uh, but it's, it's part of the, the constellation of factors working on this. Um, and then there's some other stuff. Uh, you know, they're just sort of, if you think about this for five seconds, you'd come to, to all the same conclusions too, right? Uh, you know, middle class wages in America have been basically stagnant, basically flat since the early 1970s. Uh, you know, less money for, for kids makes people less likely to have kids. The costs of raising kids have actually gone up dramatically since the early 1970s. Um, and the costs in all, in all senses. Uh, we have, you know, the FDA keeps track of the really fixed costs of kids, vitamins, clothes, doctor's appointments, those sorts of things. Uh, in constant dollars, those are up about 20% since 1965. Uh, on top of that, we have added the need for college, basically. In 1965, 30% of graduating high school seniors went on to college. Today it's over 70 percent. Uh, at the same time, the cost, the real cost of college has increased by 1,000 percent. Um, and so you have all that, and then layer on top of that, opportunity costs now that we have, you know, mostly two-income families. So, you know, you have a kid, you either are paying lots of child care, or, or you are having opportunity costs of somebody not being in the workforce for at least the first few years. Uh, so all of this sort of explains to you, I think, in ways that are, are pretty obvious and pretty commonsensical why we would have fewer kids. Uh, and then there's the culture, and this is where it gets really hard. Um, so the cultural stuff is, is giant and enormous and diffuse, uh, and you can, if you're really interested, you can read the book about it. Uh, but I'll, I'll just talk really quick here about uh, sex, because who doesn't want to talk about sex? Um, so. We have really changed our relationship between sex, baby making, and family formation in America. So if you go back to 19, 1960, 1965, um, you, could, you could say the following three things, generally speaking, understanding that there are exceptions. Uh, you had to get married to have sex. Uh, you couldn't have sex without having kids. And you didn't have kids out of wedlock. Now, some people did each of these things, um, and in fact, Actually, there's an interesting book about how much premarital sex was going on back in 1965. Um, it turns out it's quite a lot, more than you would think. But what's interesting about it is the premarital sex in 1965 tended to be between a man and a woman four to six weeks before their wedding day. So it was literally premarital sex <laughs> in ways which today it isn't. 
and so you know, so we had, so we have, you know, we have the birth control pill, uh, which has enormous effects. We have the rise of divorce. You know, once we have no-fault divorce laws, it changes, and divorces go from like, you know, like one in ten marriages to to like. 4.5 out of 10 marriages. Uh, you have cohabitation, which sort of arises as an alternate form of family, uh, family formation. And, and then you have the total acceptance of out-of-wedlock births, which, I mean, do you guys, do you guys know what the percentage of, of births that are out-of-wedlock in the last year? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, 41% for all, 48% for first births. So among first kids being born, it's 48%. Um, as this means, you know, you can have sex whenever you want. You know, you, you don't have to have a baby because you have the birth control pill. You can get married or you cannot get married to have sex. That's fine. And you can have a baby whenever you want and not have to worry about anybody judging you. And the result that this has had, sort of just purely as a matter of demographics, is it has pushed the age of first sex very, very early. It has pushed the age of first marriage very, very late. And how this all impacts demographics is because, you know, the people who tend to have the most kids are people who are married. And... Uh, you know, we may have, people may have a kid out of wedlock, sometimes even two kids out of wedlock, but not going to have, you know, real families out because it's really, really hard to raise a kid as a single parent. Uh, but as you push that age of first marriage further and further out into the future, you wind up just cutting off the window of space you have to have kids. And so this is, you know, you've shrunk in that window, and that's, that's really what's going on here. Um, and that's, that's problematic. Uh, now... What I've just given you, this, this sort of little tour of the, the economic stuff and the cultural stuff, that is one of two worldviews on what has happened with fertility. And this is the sort of causal worldview. Uh, and in a sense, actually, this is very comforting. Because if you believe in the causal worldview, then you believe that if we just think about this very smartly and we come up with good policy solutions, then we can you know, pull this lever or push that button and we can fix this. Uh, and maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But there is an alternate, an alternate view of this, an alternate view. Uh, and it was put together by uh, a pair of European demographers, Ron Lesthegi and Dirk Vandeka. And uh, what, what they suggest is, in fact, that this has been a, a giant, a giant, for lack of a better word, shift in modernity. Uh, and so they're sort of their grand unified theory, they call this the theory of the second demographic transition. And what they argue is, uh, we were talking about this last night at dinner, that this is a fundamental shift in how people view themselves and their place in the world. And this is why we see the same thing in Iran, the same thing in Brazil, the same thing in Canada, same thing in Japan, same thing in America. Uh, and so everything winds up becoming self-actualization. And so people see themselves as like the protagonist in their own movie. They see themselves at the center of their own world. And that this is what causes them not to have kids. Uh, because frankly, having kids is no fun. Um, so this is, this is, I think, a very, a very powerful lens with which to view what's been going on. Uh, and to be sure, this isn't an either or. It's not that either the causists are right or the second demographic transition folks are right. I suspect they're probably both right to some limited degree. Um, but I find the second demographic transition stuff very, very powerful because what it's saying is the saying. The reason people aren't having kids is because they don't want to. And, uh, and I understand that, because having kids kind of stinks. So I will now proceed to make the case against children for you. Um, <laughs> so they cost, as, as we said, an enormous amount of money. Um, when you actually do all the math and you do the sunk costs and the college tuition and the, uh, the opportunity costs slash daycare, it, it winds up, put my Dr. Evil voice on, $1.1 million for a child in, in just sort of middle class. I mean, that's not in Coven Cambridge. That's like if you're out in Missouri. Uh, that's really, really expensive. Uh, the average house in America is $189,000. So having a kid is like buying six houses all at once, but they don't appreciate in value. You can't sell them. And then <laughs> after 16 years, like, you know, she runs up to her room and she slams the door and she yells down, I hate you. Like, you know, there's... Because recent people don't do this. Uh, <laughs> Social Security has really made children obsolete. One of the reasons people used to have kids is to take care of you in your dotage. Uh, you don't really need to do that anymore. The state has set up a competing set of benefits uh, for people, and so that's nice uh, to have. And the other reason, the real reason not to have kids, is because they make you miserable. Uh, I should say not everybody is made miserable by this. Your, your mileage may vary. But there's been a lot, of, a lot of study over this over the last 40 years or so looking at parental happiness. And in all the sociology that's been committed on the subject, there is only a single dissenting view. And it, it's a study that came out last year that I actually think has problems. Um, 
And all of the data suggests on this that you take two people with identical demographic markers, same age, race, religion, geography, income, uh, one of them has kids, one of them does not. The person with the kids is going to be 5.9 percentage points less happy in self-reporting for the first kid, and then they lose another two points for every additional child they have after that. Uh, so this is a problem. Uh, uh, and yet, and yet, we do still need them. You know, I mean, this is, you know, again, you, you, don't want to, you don't want to go there. So we still need them. And amazingly enough, though, people still want them. And this is the part that's really weird. Uh, so, so another thing sociologists like to measure and demographers like to look at is called ideal fertility. And that is the number of kids that people tell you that they would like to have in a perfect world. Um, this, is, this is kind of hard to get at because you can see how if you're doing surveys on this and you ask ideal, you a respondent could go down the rabbit hole. You know, well, do you mean my ideal, or do you mean my perception of society's ideal, or whatever? So, I would say we don't really, really put too much store in any one survey on this. But the body of literature has shown that in America, the ideal fertility rate is uh, well. Here, you know what? Actually, let me back up. Three interesting things about ideal fertility that I think will surprise you. Um, the first is, if I were to ask you which sex prefers more kids, uh, what would you guys say? So, if I said who wants who wants more kids, men or women, who would say men? And who would say women then? The rest of you, right? So you're both wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, so men and women have substantially similar ideas about ideal fertility for their entire lives. Uh, your ideal number shifts upwards over time. It is, as you enter your childbearing years, around 17 or 18, it's incredibly low. By the time you're exiting childbearing years, around 39 or 40, it's much higher. And men and women track upward together in parallel the whole way up, which is very interesting. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting is that if, you, if all you did was read the Atlantic Monthly or the New York Times Magazine, you would think that the only people left in America who want children are same-sex couples and that, you know, everyone else had decided that there was just no interest in this and, you know, it's this old outmoded bourgeois thing. Uh, so ideal fertility in, Amer in America in 1960, uh, sorry, in 1970, before things really got bad, was 2.5. Today, it's 2.5. Um, almost exactly the same over the course of two generations. So, you know, the old outmoded bourgeois ideals uh, have held. So this is actually pretty good news for us because it means that the American challenge is not trying to, like, you know, browbeat people into having more kids uh, and not to, like, demonize our, our child-free brethren who have blissfully avoided it. Um, we should just toast them while we are picking up Cheerios at night after dinner. Um, <laughs> What, what our challenge really is, is to sort of help bridge this, this big gulf between the ideal 2.5 and the achieved 1.93. Um, now, that, of course, unfortunately, it sounds easy, but it's more complicated than, uh, than it sounds. Because the, the bad news, then, is that there are no examples of effective public policy uh, in helping people to raise their fertility rates. Almost no examples. Um, people have been trying this for a long time. Caesar Augustus did. They had fertility problems towards the end of uh, the Roman Empire. Um, he passed a bachelor tax. That did not work. Stalin, um, immediately after the Second World War, realized they needed a lot more babies. He created the Motherhood Medal, which uh, mothers got for having five or six children. You can still buy these on eBay. <laughs> I have uh, successfully, <laughs> I've successfully avoided the impulse to buy one for my wife every Christmas. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, but the, the, pro the problem, one of the problems with marriage is that you don't get credit for the bad ideas you don't act on. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, so Stalin's motherhood medals didn't really work. Uh, there are, if I could just sort of speak crudely, uh, there are two schools of thought on sort of pronatalist policies. There are what, I'll, what we'll very crudely call a liberal school, and very crudely call a conservative school, and I hope you'll just forgive me for not being like incredibly nuanced about this. So the liberal school basically says we need more daycare. You know, we need nationalized systems of daycare to help working mothers and that that will raise fertility rates. They point to Scandinavia and France as successful examples of this. Uh, this is sort of a deeply flawed um, view because when you look at France and Scandinavia, they've been at this for 80 years, like pursuing really serious, really serious pronatalist policies. Um, they've been throwing money at the problem for, as I said, 80 years. Uh, their fertility rates go from like 1.7 to 1.5. Uh, and in France, they're pretty good. They're around two. But that's only because of mass immigration. If you look at like native French fertility, it's actually 1.7. So, uh, so that stuff doesn't work. And then there is the conservative school. And the conservative school is all about like uh, tax incentives and uh, you know, market forces and all this stuff. And so uh, I give the ur example of this is Singapore. And so Singapore. Uh, 
got really spooked about their low fertility rates about 15 years ago. And they, they basically, they went the full, the full Jonathan last and you know, like what I would do if I were king for a day. So you, you have a baby in Singapore, you get a check for $9,000. You have another baby, you get a check for $18,000. Know, they have 401 savings accounts for kid care expenses. So you know, for every dollar you put in, the government puts in a buck and you use those for diapers or mashed peas or whatever. Uh, they, housing is largely state controlled and so if you have two kids they will help the grandparents move near you so the grandparents can do child care while you guys are working uh, they haven't outlawed abortion but they've gone as close to it as they can massive public campaigns against abortion uh, massive public campaigns in favor of marriage and against single parenthood uh, you know, and including like you know, annual addresses by the by the prime minister about the evils of like Murphy Brown. So I, the guys in Singapore make Rick Santorum look like a filthy hippie, right? <laughs> uh, and over the course of this, Singapore's fertility rate has gone from 1.5 to 1.1, 1 .1, uh, which is you know one of the lowest fertility rates in the world today. But not just that; it's one of the lowest fertility rates in all of recorded history. Uh, so the stuff that you know. The, the stuff that my people would want doesn't seem to work very well either. Uh, in, in, there's been a lot of demographic look at this, you know, look at, looking for efficaciousness. And what it suggests is that for every 25% increased spending you throw at pronatalist policies, be they liberal or conservative, you get about a 0.4% increase in the fertility rate. So you really, they're effective very, very much at the margins. Uh, you know, and, and so there are, there are some countries which are trying things that are a little bit outside the box. Uh, you probably have seen them just because sort of they come up as drudge headlines every once in a while. Uh, so Japan, things are really bad in Japan. Uh, and so they created a robot baby. His name is Yotaro because, you know, they're Japanese. They, let's throw a robot at the problem. And, uh, <laughs> and so Yotaro is like the creepiest looking thing you've ever seen. And, you know, he's got these giant eyes and his skin is made of silicon. And the idea is they get young couples like hanging out with Yotaro in the hope that they'll want their own meat space version of him later down the road. And this has not worked. Uh, in Russia, Putin is obsessed with demographics. Uh, they instituted Family Contact Day a few years ago. Have you guys heard of Family Contact Day? It is so everybody gets off from work and you go home and you make boom boom for the motherland. And uh, nine months later is Give Birth to a Patriot Day. And anybody who has a kid on Give Birth to a Patriot Day like comes home from the hospital with fabulous prizes. And so like, you know, like, here's your baby and a blender, uh, you know, or a microwave. I think you know, the grand prize uh, the year before last was an SUV. Uh, it really hasn't worked very well for them either. Um, and so anyway, I, you know, well, I want to close this up so we can actually have a conversation. Uh, but uh, I always tell audiences, I am not going to be held responsible, and I am not, I'm not telling anybody personally to have children. Um, just the children are important. Uh, because, you know, we do actually need kids, or, or else we'll be Germany. Germany, uh, Anna, you probably know about this, right? So Germany's fertility rate is 1.43, really, really low. Uh, they, over the last couple of years, have lost 1.5 million people. Uh, they are slated by 2060 to have lost about 20% of the population. They're really sort of the guys over there who do demographics are really wigged out. Um, and so you're already seeing some of, some of what's going on here, uh, seeing the effects in Germany. So out in the east, they actually have some urban centers where they have wolves running around now. And they have a, a wolf problem where wolves haven't been in 400 years because there just aren't enough people to, to keep them at bay. Um, if you go to graduate school in Germany for urban, urban planning now, uh, chances are as good as not that you're actually going to be studying uh, how to take out buildings, not how to build them. So how to go into like an urban core and take out a block which has a factory that's empty and an apartment building that's empty, a school that's not being used, turn it into green space and keep the urban core coherent. Uh, and, uh, and so they, they have actually in the state of Westphalia, they have this big labor problem uh, because they have uh, underemployed sex workers because there aren't enough young men and not enough elder care nurses for the nursing homes. And so, <laughs> so the state looked at this problem, very logically decided, well, this problem solves itself. And so they have a government-run government run initiative to take prostitutes and train them up and turn them into old folks' homes nurses. Uh, so I would say that, you know, so somebody's got to have kids, uh, you know, as my, or, you know or, or my grandparents will all move off to Dusseldorf. Um, uh, but, you know, I really did, so, you know, the, the, the tagline, I wish I had thought of this, the tagline for my book came from PJ O'Rourke, who, uh, who said this, I'll just close with this, the only thing worse than having kids is not having them. And, 
And so that's where we are. Thank you for having me. So do you want me to just like pull this down and we'll talk? Or how do you They take it. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Because I okay. Because I I'm very self-conscious about my Barry White voice. Um, so they take it at all points, and you actually see. I, I was poor mouthing kids there for a fact, but I'll give you the full the full tour here. Um, so when you have kids, your happiness levels drop precipitously, um, but over time you begin recovering them, and you don't you begin recovering them typically around age 55 which, huh, what happens around age 55? Oh, your kids leave home. So once you're 55, uh, you begin recovering some happiness levels. Around 55, the people who didn't have kids began losing some happiness. The, the sociologists refer to this as window shopper's remorse. Yeah, they're sort of regretting the kids they didn't have. And, you know, by the time you kick it, everybody settles at about the same place. So that's nice, but, you know, there's also like 30 years in the middle where you're miserable because you had kids. Uh, well, that could be some of the recovered happiness. Is, although I would say, you know, not contrary to popular belief, not all grandparents really like their grandchildren. And, and so, <laughs> again, your mileage may vary. <coughs> do you want to call? Do you, uh, want to call you? I know. Uh, I just want to reconcile how, um, if parents are unhappier, how do you reconcile that with your saying that their ideal view of having number of children? Peaks at 39 or 40. That would because they're also irrational. <laughs> no, I, I, I think so. You have a couple things going on here, right? Uh, it, one of them is that over time, as you experience the kids, I think there is some sense of wanting to have siblings for the kids, uh, and you also wind up once you get to higher parity births, uh, those people have very, very different religious uh, views. Um, people, we actually talk about this if you're interested in it. Um, religiosity winds up being an enormously powerful predictor of fertility, particularly parity there, uh, birth parity. So, this is you know, as you're getting up, people. I think once you start having kids, those people change and you know are saying, well, I'm in it already. I may not love it, but you know, why not keep having the family now? Uh, and a lot of those people are religious believers and practitioners too. Um. I noticed uh, our, on the chart you had on the board for the la throughout your talk of Japan, and you've drawn two circles. Uh, but I was, this, the circles on the top for old folks uh, excludes, uh, uh, the top circle excludes people like Harvey who were over the age of 80. Why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, actually, I just chose those because of the largest cohort. And so if you, I don't have it up there. I mean, if you look at the, 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 next, the next 10 years are still bigger. I think they're, they're only twice as opposed to three times the size. Um, so like the 80 to 90 year olds are twice the size, I think, of the zero to tens. Um, it's really big. I mean, so they, where Japan is headed is they're going to have, uh, by 2030, every year for every kid born, they're also going to have somebody turning 100. So you'll have like an, in, an equal number each year of newborns and centurions. Uh, and this is you know, part of the just longevity. They, they live really long over in Japan, particularly the women. Yeah. But don't they impose costs? Um, I mean, why didn't you circle them? Uh, I, I'm just illustrating. I, I could easily have circled more. I was just picking a cohort to make a point. There, there really, there was no, there was no pernicious. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't trying to single anyone out. <laughs> Uh, it looks to me like um, your data, if we go in the Japanese direction, shows it's, it's a very bad prospect for the welfare state, which makes me very happy, um, and also bad for universities, which makes me um, less happy, but still happy. I, think we have, uh, I agree with the discussion, which interest in uh, overvaluing of university education. Um, one thing I've noticed is that I, I, um, I've had a succession of Thai huskeepers. Uh, one of whom has now declared that she's my daughter. Uh, and I, I've gotten to understand the Thai system. They don't have any welfare in the Thai system. Uh, and you depend, there's a lot of intergenerational dependency. So when you're growing up, you pick out a sibling who's going to help take care, a younger cohort is going to take care of you when you get old. And you also pick out an older person 
who is going to help you, uh, as you, who's going to give you her wealth when she goes, or his wealth when she goes. Uh, this seems to be a pattern among ties. There's a lot more intergenerational dependence, uh, which is a good thing for the family, and also leads people to value children. So um, uh, I think that getting rid of the welfare state would be a tremendous step forward. Uh, and, and since America is such a wealthy country, uh, and there's so many, um, there are so many uh, other ways to get money to the needy people that then send it to Washington to a politician to, to, to redistribute for you, that uh, this, this, is the, this is the most obvious solution to, or, or it would solve a lot of the problem if you just got rid of the welfare state, which is going to be unsustainable anyway in 20 years, it seems. Well, if you know how, I'll sign on. Um, no, so there have been two, two uh, national affairs uh, ran a, a great piece about precisely this question a year or two ago, and there have been there have been two pretty good econometric analyses of this, and they suggest that Social Security and Medicare have the effect in America of depressing the fertility rate overall by half a kid, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot. So it's the whole, yeah, it's the whole, the whole ball of wax. Of course, then you have unintended, they said, well, you know, if we killed welfare and Medicare tomorrow, what would happen? Um, and nobody knows. I mean, you know, huge unintended consequences. <coughs> so one of the, the idea of intergenerational dependency is really, really interesting. Um, so, you know, like, all books like my book, the last chapter is supposed to be the solutions, you know, how to fix everything. Uh, and my book, one of its many failings is that the last chapter is basically I kind of throw my hands up in the air. I don't want to spoil the end for you. Um, but I kind of throw my hands up in the air and I say, well, people have tried some stuff and here's what they've done. And here is how it hasn't worked. And good luck. Uh, so, but, but intergen, one of the things that when people look at this, they, they fixate on is the idea of intergenerational, intergenerational dependency. You know, so getting into a multi-generational home with parents, kids, grandparents, the parents <coughs> care for the fair care for the grandparents, the grandparents help out with child care. But that is sort of mucked up in America by the massive mobility that we've sort of experienced over the last 40 years, where people now pick up and just take off. Um, and but the the hope of the people so like Walter Russell Mead and Phil Longman when they write about this stuff they are very very encouraged by the idea of telecommuting, and they think that telecommuting could be the, the silver bullet solution for all of this and so that if you grow up in North Carolina or Montana you can get a good job uh, and still not have to leave if you don't want to, and I'm not I'm interested in this but I'm not I'm not terribly optimistic. Everyone convert to Buddhism where you can have multiple wives and multiple children. <laughs> multiple wives, sure, but not multiple children. <laughs> I think I saw some Drudge headline last month that was pointing out how many uh, babies had been conceived by artificial means uh, in recent years. And the number was a lot higher than I expected. And I, it, insofar as some of these are demographic uh, trends are driven by basically the labor market considerations. So you're spending your 20s and 30s getting credentialed, earning money. Maybe you start to want babies and you're in your late 30s, but at that point the biological clock's ticking down. It, it, do you have, is, is this going to, I don't know, the, I don't remember the numbers. It, are these going to make an impact if we get a lot, a lot more? Uh, they already or, are. Okay. Already it, are, yeah. Um, and so does that, is that, what, what are the percentage points look like on that? Is that uh, hopeful for the developed countries of the West that, uh, various technologies might get you know raise the the birth level by five or ten years. Uh, well, right. So so they already are. They they've already. I mean, they've, so reproductive technology has already really really helped out. I don't know. I don't know that we've maxed or not because it is expensive. I mean, and so in a way, this is something really is only is only available to a certain percentage of the upper crust. Uh, I think the number was five million over the last ten years. Five million births, and in America, you typically have four million births a year, give or take. So that's real. Those are real babies, yeah, as they would say. Um, so I would say, so my libertarian friends who think that this is all no big deal, they all say, well, you know, eventually it'll be the matrix and we'll just have babies in tubes and then we won't need to worry. We, don't, we won't need to worry about biology. Um, and in a sense, I guess, that, that makes sense in a way, right? Except that if, if we are so sort of blasé about whether or not we want to have kids and sort of ambivalent about it anyway, take on the extra work, and we're willing to farm all that out to that degree, well, then why would you go to the trouble of actually having the kid, right? I mean, because the pregnancy, let me tell you, is really just the start, you know? Uh, in a weird way, I, I actually think if there's an answer, a, an interesting answer is actually going in the opposite direction. And I, I look at the Mormons in the book, and I look at particularly what they've done out of BYU, 
So out of out of the Y, uh, some very large minority of the campus gets married by like junior year, and uh, some I think it winds up being like twenty percent of the kids there wind up having a kid while they're undergrads, and the the campus is set up for this. I mean, they have married student housing, which are like you know small modest townhouses, and the truth is. College is a, purely economically speaking, college is a great time to have a kid. Um, your, your opportunity costs, you, truth is, you have plenty of time. Um, you know, and uh, really, in many ways, the same. There's a lot of nudity, there's a lot of vomit, and you know, a lot of cleaning up after others. Uh, the two are almost indistinguishable, frankly. Uh, so, so anyway, so you, so you get those early years, you get at least a couple of those early years of baby stuff out of the way when, A, your, your opportunity costs for employment are zero, uh, and then even once you're, you know, once you're 25, 26, if you're missing those first couple early years, well, what do you care? I mean, really, that's not, that's, some people are throwing away their lives doing peace, not throwing away their lives, but some people are doing Peace Corps, Teach for America, something like that, you're doing your baby stuff, and then once you get the kids into, into school, then you can go to work. Um, so I would say I would find more hopefulness the idea of changing around higher ed so that people who want families, I'm, I would not encourage college, every college kid to get married while they're in college. But, you know, like if, if you are, if you're one of the minority who actually does find the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with and you're in college, well, I don't know, why shouldn't you be able to get started? Um, that makes even more economic sense, I think, than like, you know, matrix style pod babies. Uh, I noticed that demographic thing wrecking our economy, and that's very different than saying that it's going to drive humanity into endangerment. Do you think there's a lot of, like, imprecise rhetoric about this kind of thing? Repeat the question, please. Oh, so the question is, uh, I'm talking about economic calamity and not driving humanity into endangerment, and is there a lot of imprecise rhetoric on this? Is that, is that about yeah. right? Is that fair? Um, well, there isn't imprecise rhetoric for me. Uh, I think I'm pretty measured. I mean, uh, I would say another of the book's failings is that I'm constantly going, well, this could happen on the one hand, but on the other hand, it might not. I mean, this is, everything is uncertain. Uh, nobody really knows what the future is. Uh, I would say we do know with a pretty fair degree of certainty that we are not going to, like, breed ourselves into extinction um, because, you know, so as my, my demographer buddy Nick Eberstadt likes to say, uh, fertility rates are not constant across populations. So even in you know, a country like Singapore, where the fertility rate is 1.1, well, there are some people who are above replacement there, and that those people will, over the course of, you know, five or six generations, just inherit the country. So this isn't a matter of, like, you know, dwindling down to zero people or anything like that. Um, but nobody, nobody knows the future. And what drives me nuts uh, about, like, Paul Ehrlich, for instance, is that, you know, he was writing his book as though he had just hopped out of a DeLorean from the future and was reporting firsthand on what happened. Uh, and that's, you know, we don't know what's going to happen 20 years in the future, let alone 35 or 50. All we can do is look at current trends, suggest where do current trends look like they're kind of sort of heading and understand that. You know, so, you know, the, the er example of why you should take all of this stuff with some skepticism, including my book, is that if we were to go back to 1944, and you were to come to me and say, I bet you a thousand bucks that the fertility rate in America is going to double starting next year and it's going to stay doubled for 22 years. I would have said to you, I'll take that bet because there is no precedent in American history for, for, for the fertility rate doubling. Um, fertility in America have, since the founding had been on a straight line down through 1944. Uh, and then the baby boom happened. Nobody predicted it. Nobody, we still don't really understand it. You know, we have some uh, little bits of understanding. So the world is unpredictable. Things happen. We really don't know the future. We just have to, I think, uh, kind of engage with what we do know and be serious about it and uh, try to be prepared and have good discussions. Yeah. I was thinking when you talk about how government policies are generally ineffective, maybe they're ineffective because people regard having kids as a private matter and they therefore respond adversely to government hen heavy handedness, encouraging them to do so. And you know, maybe that's the case in Sing Singapore. They're supposed to be obedient over there, but what the government is doing sounds so blatant and absurd. So if that's the case, maybe one could devise policies which are gentler and which present themselves under another guise um, and, and might work because people don't s see what they're doing. Yeah, I, so 
you know, so my sense is that one of the things that's going on, one of the reasons policies tend to be ineffective is that if they are pure economic incentives, uh, people ain't stupid. And no, no. If the government offered me $2 million to have another kid, I would take it because $2 million is a lot of money and could rightly compensate. But I would say sums less than that <laughs> would not compensate for the havoc a child wreaks on your life. And people, anything that could actually scale out, you know, like, like $9,000 $9, or even $18,000 is not really compensate. For people who know what work it, a kid is and who want to avoid that work, that's just not a big enough bribe to get them to do it. And the bribes that would be big enough simply aren't, aren't scalable. Um, so one, one of the things I suggest is that uh, what the government ought to be doing, instead of trying to incentivize, uh, it would be more helpful as we think about policy. And just because policies haven't worked doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep looking for policies that would. I mean, this is, you know, as my old basketball coach used to say, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. So, we sh you know, we should be thinking about this. And God knows if you go look at Asia and you look at Europe, um, they're obsessed with this stuff. And, they're, you know, they're trying to outbid each other on pronatalist policies and trying to innovate and do things. And I think we ought to be doing that here, too. But I think the way we ought to think about it is in terms of government action, look at where the government has created distortions you know, and try to remove those distortions and those roadblocks rather than trying to incentivize, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, one of the first places people start with is actually the FICA taxes. Um, so Mike Lee, uh, the senator from Utah, did you guys see this? He put out a tax reform proposal three weeks ago. Uh, and what he, he it's, it is pro-family, and what he says is he wants to eliminate what he calls the double taxation on families for Social Security. Double taxation meaning you pay through your, your FICA uh, withholding and your paycheck, but then you also pay to raise the next generation of taxpayers. And so most of these pronatalist policies in America look at reducing FICA taxes while you've got a kid under your roof. So, you know, you scale back your FICA taxes. One, one of, I think, Ramesh Panuru's plan is 33% for the first kid, 66% for the next kid, and then 100% for the next kid through the age of like 16 or 17, and then FICA's come back in. Um, to pick another one, uh, so marriage. So marriage is incredibly important in terms of like getting people to have babies. Uh, our tax code is biased against marriage in, in the way. So you have two people cohabitating, making fifty thousand dollars each. They are taxed at the fifty thousand fifty thousand dollar marginal rate. They get married. They're ta now taxed at the hundred thousand dollar marginal rate. This seems to me something that the government should not be in the business of of doing. They they have a compelling interest to get people married because married people tend to have more babies. So I think you know little baby steps like that you can do. But I'm you know I would say I am not optimistic that you know that there is that the culture is going to do what the culture is going to do, and I'm not sure that there really is a way out of the cul-de-sac we're in. I'm sorry, I, for, I forget the exact way your names you characterize them as, but the. One global, one general explanation given was the second demographic transition. Yes, right? SDT, not STD. The second demographic transition <laughs> is one. Of, the other one was the causal. The causal, the causal, uh, method, more right? traditional right. economic causal. So the second democratic transi transition argument, to the extent that I understood it, and I gave a quick summary, it points towards I can use this sort of vague language, sort of modernity or individualism. Um, you said that people consider themselves as the protagonist in their own story. Everyone's a little hero. Um, what I, the, 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 I was just curious how they, these two groups, if they are groups, or how they talk to each other. And as much as the other the thing I had trouble understanding is you presented the drop in the fertility rate as being a global phenomenon affecting all different kinds of countries, all the industrialized countries, but then other you know, less industrialized or second world countries, we could call them. That seems to cut somewhat, in my mind anyway, against the second demographic, demographic transition theory in as much as it's, unless we think there's this individualism or modernity is everywhere, and it's not even a Western phenomenon. I just, how do you deal with this? Is, is, or or is, it, is there some seed of individualism which is so powerful and so easily spread that even recently westernized or industrialized countries catch the bug and immediately start all being, if you could say, if you want to be pejorative, narcissistic. And right. so, <laughs> And, and I mean, I, I'm just wondering how you tell, how you look at this because it's just it's weird. You gave a global view; it doesn't seem sort of Western-centric. What you would call the West, right? So I, this is why I think they're both right to some degree, right? And you can see the causal stuff acting on like the developing world countries at first, getting the ball rolling, and then as they become more sort of fully integrated into, you know, the global economy, the second demographic transition forces also taking over and acting, if that makes any sense. Um, so what, what I should have done is talk, I mean, are you interested in, in like 30 seconds on the first demographic transition and second demographic tra 
No. You got 30 seconds? Okay. So, uh, so before, in the world before the first demographic transition, the sort of the center of life, as people conceived it, was you know, the tribe, the clan. And the first demographic transition, democracy talked about taking place right around the time of industrialization in the West, uh, where all of a sudden the child becomes the center of, of family life. Uh, not, in, not in the sense that like we are today with like the crazy helicopter parents and all that, but in the sense that if you, know, you live on a farm uh, and you've got 10 kids, your duty now is not to like your extended clan, but is to bettering the outcomes for your 10 kids and give them a life better than yours. Yeah, and so as the theory goes, coming around the time of the late 1960s, the, the child is then displaced by the individual themselves, and so by the mom or the dad. And they then look at you know, the world around them with themselves at the center. You know, they are like sort of heliocentric then. Um, and so you know, this is why marriage becomes more of a transient thing. Uh, you know, marriage is no longer lifelong. Part of the reason why, you know, to the extent that people have kids, they're doing it because it is an act of self-actualization for them. It's something they want to experience, something they want to do. They want to have, a, it was important for me to have a kid uh, in like the Snooky sense, you know. Why, why, is Snook, why did Snooky have a baby? Because it was sort of important for Snooky to have a baby. Uh, so, the, so the deeper philosophical question about whether those forces are acting on like Iran, um, I think they might be, right? I mean, this is like, if you believe in the idea of like global culture, you know, pushing its way into all, all sectors and all nooks and crannies. Um, I, I think it's reasonable su to suspect that this might be happening too. This might be part of it. Um, but we don't know. And, you know, I, so one, one of the things that the, uh, the, the Vandica and Lestegi talk about is they talk about, you know, the other things that you see happening around the times of self-actualization, uh, of self, um, of de self second demographic transition. And they say that you see, um, you know, liberalized abortion laws, happening. You know, in societies that are undergoing this, you, you see liberalized abortion laws, you see increased rates of divorce, increased rates of cohabitation, and later marriage and later age of first birth, and that these things all sort of, you know, they move together, and that these are like the, what, the five horsemen of the second demographic transition. And this has been broadly true. You know, when you, when you look even at a country like Iran, you look at Brazil, and you know, these things do tend to happen all together. And there are not a lot of examples of countries going the other direction. Um, uh, in fact, there's, there's really only one example of a country going backwards in fertility from lowest low uh, up to pretty high, and that's Georgia. Um, yeah, so Georgia is really interesting. So Georgia, uh, post, post collapse of the Soviet Union, their fertility rate drops really fast to about 1.4. Um, and the, uh, so over in Georgia, you guys may know this, I, I didn't, they're really devout. They're all members of the Georgian Orthodox Church. And uh, so the patriarch of the church, this guy, Ilya II, he comes out and he says, I'm going to personally baptize all third-born children. And the next day, the next day, the next uh, year, the fertility rate goes up 20%. The year after that, the fertility rate goes up 20%. And they are now just within spitting distance of replacement. They're like 1.98 or something like that. Um, and so this guy does these every month, these mass baptisms where he like, you know, goes out into the square of the cathedral and baptizes like 20,000 kids. Um, which again, I think sort of, I've sort of lied this. We actually didn't spend a lot of time talking about this. We can, if you guys are interested, talk about the effects of religion. But I think it, it cuts, in a way, I find that sort of validating of the second demographic transition theory, you know, this sort of obverse case. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was a longer answer than you probably wanted. I took more than 30 seconds. A uh, question about, I was, one thing I was expecting to see in your book is a lot of talk about the status of women and its relationship to fertility. So on the one hand, when women have a very low status, they often have very many children in Afghanistan, so, um, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, then you swing to the other side, modernity, they, they, suddenly their status is raised, they stop having children. But the countries that do seem to do well post, um, in, in Western, Euro Western European industrialized countries, uh, that do have highest fertility rates, seem to me, I mean, I'm curious on your take on this, have their women have the highest status. I mean, just, I mean, I would much rather be a Swedish woman than an Italian woman, no question. Yeah. <laughs> um, on and a cultural level, in many, many ways. So you didn't talk much about that, about raising the status of women in societies. Be, I mean, because they, they prefer marriage. I mean, if in many ways they should, et cetera. So, uh, so this is so totally true. One of, one of the, big, the big points of study is the difference in fertility rates between Northern and Southern Europe. Right. So, uh, so Northern European countries, reasonably high fertility rates, 1.7, 1.6, you know, this is Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland, 
not Switzerland, Switzerland, not Norway, help me out, Nor- Norway, uh, France. And then you get down to, you know, the, the, the pigs, Spain, Greece, uh, Portugal, Italy, uh, very, very low fertility, around 1.4 or so. Uh, anyway, and this sort of vitiates, you know, one of the, I think conservatives here in America automatically assume that, like, women in the workforce is part of what has been driving our fertility decline. Uh, and this turns out not to be not to be particularly true, actually. Uh, and this is what you see. One of the big differences over in between the Northern Europeans and the Southern Europeans is women's labor participation rates. Uh, much, much higher. They're like 75% in the North, like 40% in the South, uh, which suggests to us then that women's labor participation rate need not be determinative um, in fertility rates, right? Uh, so you talk about the status of women. Um, relative to these two. But what's really interesting is male view of parenting. And one of the big differences is the amount of time men in the Northern European countries spend on parenting versus the men in the South. Isn't that correlated to their view of women, women's work as being beneath them? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm just talking about quantifiable stuff. Not, you know, and, but certainly, I think you could argue that that is the case. Um, and so part of what you see is really, really high levels of participation of husbands um, in the North really, really low participation you know, of husbands in doing like child care stuff in the South. Uh, and we have seen in America very happily um, a, a massive change in the role men have taken on, on in, in child bear, uh, childbearing. <laughs> not, not yet. We have to wait on that. Uh, no, in child care. And so, you know, so we have you know, pretty good pretty good stats on this uh, because it's a longitudinal study based on time diaries. Uh, and married men now do, I think it's two and a half times as much uh, child care work as they did 40 years ago. Uh, working, stay-at-home moms do about two and a half times. And working moms, oddly enough, now do more child care than stay-at-home moms in 1965 did. So like every. <laughs> Maybe this is good, but also maybe this is bad. Maybe we're like crazy about our kids and we need to like spend less time with them and just send them out to the yard and hope they don't die. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think actually it, a lot of this has to do with men and it, this could be all in relation to women's status. Um, Japan, one of the big things they have over there is men won't do anything. Um, you know, they view it as just a task that they are not suited to. And I get that because it ain't fun, you know, but, uh, but on the other hand, you know, my wife and I tend to view it as the we are united together against the beings that are trying to destroy our lives. And so, <laughs> you know, we, we are both in the foxhole together against the terrorists, and together we shall prevail. Um, so, and I, you know, I think that that's, truth be told, I think that that is probably the, I would say that because that's how we run things in my marriage. But I think that's probably, you know, like raising kids is hard and it kind of blows. And, uh, you know, like, why why be in it if you're not going to, like, be in it to be doing it with your partner? So. So uh, in order to talk a little bit more about religion, which you, you said you didn't talk about much, you said when immigrants come to the United States and other places, their fertility rates drop really quickly. Is that also true of orthodox groups of various orthodox religions? Is Are those groups also shrinking or growing? Are the children of orthodox groups... Uh, uh, becoming less orthodox, or is it possible there'll be some sort of equilibrium where, be, where, where there will be a much larger percentage of orthodox people in Western countries at some point? Yes. So there's a great book written on this. I believe he's on staff here. His guy his name is Eric Kaufman. Do you guys anybody know him? Am I wrong about him? Um, he wrote a book called "Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth?" I think he's at Harvard. I could be wrong. Um, and so what he's looking at basically is three three rate differentials. For, for lack of a better word. Uh, so the first rate differential is the rate differential between fertility rates of orthodox believers and non-believers. And for orthodox, we're just using, it turns out that uh, sectarian religious differences have shrunken down to about nothing in America. And what we really have is religiosity differences. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you are Catholic, Mormon, Jew, Protestant. What matters is how often you go to services. Um, and at the same, you know, at the same participation rate level, the, the, sec- the different sects have basically the same fertility rates. Um, so, so you look at the, the fertility differences between the two. You then look at the pass-on rate of, of religion from parents to kids, and then you look at the attrition rate of adult believers and practitioners. How, what rate do they fall away? And when Kaufman has looked at that data, he thinks uh, that over the course of the next 20 years or so, we are he says that we are probably at the high watermark of secularism because the seculars are having so few kids. Uh, 
parents who go to church actually are very successful at passing on. This is one of the things parenthood, parenthood can really do two things, uh, really do two things. One of which is it, active parenting can delay uh, sexual initiation of uh, daughters. Not boy, not sons, but daughters. You can keep your daughter from, from having sex and, uh, or from having sex so early. And uh, I hope, God, I hope, because um, we have two daughters. Uh, but, uh, but you can also pass on your religion at a very, very successful rate. Uh, and so the, the seculars are actually not as good at pulling people away from the church in adulthood as we think they are. And so when Kaplan looks at it, he thinks that we are, we are bound to become more orthodox over the course of the next 35 years. And also part of this is because of our immigrants are largely Catholic from Central and South America, They're, many of them are practicing religious too. They come in, uh, their fertility falls away, but their religious they fall within the continuum of what we expect fertility-wise from religious practitioners pretty well. Uh, and uh, I would say, so, you know, so my doppelganger on the left, um, he's not really my doppelganger, he's my hero, is, is a guy named Phil Longman, uh, who wrote what is really the best book on demographic, best popular book on demographics, it's called The Empty Cradle. Uh, everybody should own two books on demographics, mine and Phil's, but if you're only gonna get one, get Phil's. Um, so Phil's progressive, he's the New America Foundation, um, and, you know, so he tried, like, sounding the alarm about this to, like, his, his people a few years ago. He wrote this great uh, piece for foreign affairs called The Return of the Patriarchy, in which he was arguing that, like, you know, hey, fellow NPR listeners, we ought to have some kids because if we don't, you know, like, the world's going to be inherited by, you know, the people who watch NASCAR and worse. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I would say it was striking to the extent that the left did not want to hear this. Like really didn't want to hear it, and you know, cast you know, treated Phil like he was like Rush Limbaugh or something. Um, you know, like how dare you suggest that we have kids? When what he what he was suggesting is you know, in a, in a slightly more pointed way, uh, what he was suggesting was that you know we like this the society we've built, and we would like to pass it on to people who are basically like minded, and so we ought to have kids, uh, and that is. I, I would say at the heart of all my concerns, you know, we talked about, you know, but, like I don't believe there's a, a geezer apocalypse. We're not going to fall apart, I don't think. I don't think it's going to be beyond Thunderdome with old people, I don't think. Um, and in the long run, everything will be fine, right? In the very long run, you know, we'll all be dead, but there will be people having kids, and there will be people running around the world. Um, but if we like this nice little Western civilization that we've spent a couple thousand years building up, and we like the sort of the liberalism, you know, the small ill, or would it be big L liberalism um, that we've that we've created? This is going to come under all sorts of stresses in the medium run, you know, over the course of the next fifty or sixty years as we get from A to B, and that if we would like to work at preserving that, we ought to be thinking about it uh, now. Um, what about um, feminism? I'm asking, hopefully, <laughs> uh, bearing a, a share of the responsibility for fertil fertility decline. So I, I would say I was, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was shocked at the hostility that my book received from the feminist left. Um, because I mean, if I could sort of, if I could sort of try to sort of honestly recreate their, their criticisms, it was uh, JVL it wants all women to be running around barefoot and pregnant, and we don't want kids, and how dare he? He's history's greatest monster. Um, <laughs> And I, you know, I, I guess I don't quite get that because uh, <coughs> the biggest spread between ideal for, and achieved fertility is among the highest educated women. These are the people who are underachieving their ideals the most, um, and including women on the left, you know, like women with advanced graduate degrees who are, you know, who vote reliably democratically. Um, like, really, I, I say this throughout the book, and I really do mean it. Like, I, I am not interested in arguing that people who don't want kids should have them. Um, I don't want kids like 18 hours out of every day and I'm stuck with them. So, uh, but, but there is, there's a weird sense, I think, about, at least just judging by the feminist reaction to, to my silly little book, that any argument that children are important must necessarily become an argument that all women have children. And that's why, I mean, I tried, you know, like five different times during the book of like stepping aside and saying, look, just as a reminder, if you don't want to have kids, God bless you. Um, but the, the feminist left seems sort of hard to, hard, seems difficult to understand that. And I, I think that's a missed opportunity for them. We, we were talking about Elizabeth Warren briefly. Uh, so she wrote 10 or 12 years ago now this book called The Two-Income Trap, uh, Two Trap, which was this 
you know, this feminist populist it could have been conservative. It really could have been written by Rick Santorum. Screw it against like the economic system that compels women to work and then underachieve their family desires. And like, why why couldn't this be part of like normal bien pensant uh, leftist feminist thought? I don't understand why it couldn't be. It seems to me perfectly logical. I mean, you could. I mean, I myself, I'm, I, you know, so if Irving Kristol is two cheers for capitalism, I'm like one and a half, you know, like I'm a really bad conservative and a bad Republican. Um, and I think, you know, our, our current economic system actually bears some amount of blame for this. And so I kept waiting for someone on the left to mount like an anti-capitalist feminist case for kids and it never came. And so, I don't know, I, you know, part of my project is like trying to goad somebody to come out from the woodwork on the left and like link hands with me on this, but uh, nobody is. Yeah, it's strange, but inter interesting that feminism is not uh, any capitalist. I right, know, I guess that's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to reassure you, parenting does get better over time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so long as I live that long. Right. I would say they get more and more interesting, and then they just leave. Oh, I like that. Sounds great. <laughs> but I actually have a question, which is um, you pointed out two problems. Uh, one, obviously, the fertility rate. Uh, the other you mentioned in passing, in, uh, in this country, we have this very high level of out of uh, wedlock child, especially by young, poorly educated uh, women with very few skills. Which it, So it, uh, there's... I think it's quite clear if we want to reduce levels of poverty, we want to increase upper social mobility, we want to reduce that. Um, uh, but that would seem to be in tension with um, trying to increase the fertility rate. Um, I suppose the good news is that we haven't figured out how to lower the fertility rate among young, poorly educated women uh, who are not married. But could you say something about the tension or uh, between those two? Yeah. Yeah. And then and there is a tension between the two. Um, you know, I think one of the – so you guys, will, many of you are old enough to will remember, like, the big sociological fight of the 70s about marriage and cohabitation and out-of-wedlock births. And are these, you know, are these all just equivalent modes of family formation, or is it right to prefer one over the other, right? And uh, that fight is basically over. And, and there's, you know, broad, there are a couple holdouts who are like, you know, the last guys in the Japanese islands coming out with, you know, with guns in 1980s saying, where's the war, where's the war? But for the most part, everybody now agrees that the gold standard for just by outcomes is, you know, man and woman married together having their kids uh, and better for them to get married before they have the kid too. And so I, I actually, in a weird way, I'm hopeful in all of this because you can now make what is essentially like a very traditionalist, orthodox, cons you know, like social conservative case, but you can make that case using only language and, language and data from the left. Like you could, you could do that solely using papers issued by the Brookings Institution, uh, which is helpful. In fact, the Brookings just last week put out a, a thing trying to look at how much of like the income inequality spread that we've seen over the last 10 years is actually based on single parenthood. Uh, and it's, it's a huge part, as it turns out. Um, so, you know, to the, to the extent I think that you have to, have to, I think it would be fruitful to try attacking the fertility problem by attacking the marriage problem and by talking about marriage as a good, getting more people married. And as you sort of convert more people into marriage, then they're going to naturally have more kids, I think. Uh, but it's not clear to me how, if that's any more achievable than like getting rid of Social Security. I, I don't really know. Um, I know that even some of the people on the left, uh, like, like so Isabel Sawhill, um, who is pro-marriage, recognizes all of the, you know, all the benefits of marriage, is a champion of marriage. She is, I think I would fairly, this is a fair characterization, she is very depressed uh, about the prospect of that coming back. She thinks that this is sort of a ship that may have now sailed and we have to sort of make our peace and adapt to it. Um, I'm not so willing to throw in the towel on that just because the effects are so are so gigantic. I mean, you, the Charles Murray book, Coming Apart, looking at you know, what has happened with marriage and out of wedlock childbirth, uh, and not just among like the poorest of the poor, but going up through like the lower middle class too, uh, and it's really problematic. Um, I think you said that Japan had had a demographic recession for 23 years, uh, and I guess fortunately Japan achieved a certain level of uh, wealth to grapple with this, but if the Japanese have been dealing with this problem 
if, if the Japanese to a large extent are the world's future, uh, and if they've been grappling with this problem for decades, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could say some more about uh, whether they have whether they have given us any uh, in how they've wrestled with the problem, and if, if they've done anything that uh, might end your talk in a hopeful way. No, uh, no. <laughs> so, so the Japanese. Um, yeah, you know, I sort of. I, if you go to the book, there's. I, I put a funny little chart in it, charting like you know the name of the the year, the name of the 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 policy initiative, what the policy initiative is, and then the the fertility rate. You just sort of you know year by year by year. There's always another for initiative Japan. for Japan, for Japan, and the, you know there's always a new initiative. And you know, some of these things they're so fundamentally unserious. You know they uh, they have one program where they mandated that employers and companies with over 300 uh, employees put together a plan to raise their employees' fertility rates, just to put together a plan. And if you did put together a plan and submit it to the government, whether or not you actually implemented it, then the government authorized you to put this little pink logo that looks like uh, Hello Kitty on your letterhead <laughs> and on advertisements. You know, it's like one of these corporate you know, sponsorship logos. And if you don't do it, well, that's fine. I mean, this is sort of insane, you know, just not, not addressing the problem, not actually looking at what's really going on. Uh, it, just in the last couple of years, they've, they've really gotten a little bit more serious about this, and they are going down the road of uh, creating what is colloquially known as a housewife's allowance. And so, you know, a sort of tax benefit, sort of cash out of pocket. I think it's like 300 bucks a month for stay-at-home mothers. Um, it has not been effective at all. Uh, you know, I think... They didn't, you know, I mean, so the easy answer for Japan would be immigration, right? I mean, their immigration is yeah. basically zero, uh, but they don't want it, and for reasons which, some of which are understandable, some of which are less understandable. I mean, you know, so at the end of the day, Japan likes being Japanese, and their fertility rate is so low that if they were to start allowing mass immigration, the character of Japan would change very quickly. Uh, and I, I think, I particularly out here, I think there's a tendency to dismiss, well, that's their fault. They ought, to just, they ought to just let in lots of, you know, lots of people from abroad and, you know, make do with it. Uh, that's easy for us to say because that's our culture and that's how we've always been. And I actually have some sympathy for Japan and, you know, their own sort of cultural, I'd say cultural chauvinism, but I don't really mean it in the, in the negative way. Uh, you know, I, I get that and I understand it. They're in a tough spot. So there's no country in the world that has realized we, can, in effect, we can't, raise fertility rates, and no country in the world apparently has, has admitted this and started to say, therefore, we're going to have to uh, find other solutions to the problem. Well, they're all still looking, right? And this is why I say, you know, just because nothing has worked particularly well yet doesn't mean we're not going to figure something out eventually. Um, you know, we might, we might not. Um, but even relying on immigration is not I don't think is like you know a very particularly sustainable thing in the long term. So you look at here in America, we uh, we've had 38 million immigrants over the last 30 years or so. Numerically, it's the largest uh, influx of immigrants in our nation's history. As a percentage of the population, it's not actually. It's the second largest. Um, but you have a couple things happening. One, you have recent immigrants having their fertility rates regress to the mean very quickly. Two, you have the fertility rates south of our border falling precipitously. Mexico, just last year or the year before, hit the replacement rate, and they will probably be below replacement in the next five years or so, we think. Historically, countries with below replacement fertility don't send immigrants outward. And so, you know, like if, we, if our whole strategy here in America was relying on immigrants, um, even if you were perfectly fine with that, even if you were prepared to deal with all the, the tensions, you know, and the problems and costs that arise from that, uh, it's not clear that you could do that. Uh, you know, there's, I, I, have this, I wrote this down because it's sort of interesting to me. So uh, if we wanted to hold our, hold our Social Security ratio of workers to retirees at where it is now, at 3, three to 1, we would need another 45 million immigrants between now and 2035. And we've had 38 million over the last, I mean, that, that's a huge, huge influx. Now, this isn't to say it's not a good idea, maybe it is, uh, but it's an idea that comes with its own costs, right? And if you wanted to raise, and this is actually, this is from Longman, this is from his great thing. If you wanted to get our Social Security ratio back to where it was in like 60, five workers for every retiree, uh, you need 10.8 10, 10 million immigrants a year every year which is like building, uh, you know, like a new New York City every 10 months or something. It just carries, even if you, even if you were really into the idea, it carries enormous cost to it. Uh, 
So, you know, and, and eventually, you know, I mean, the world is a closed system. Like, we, you're going to run out of bodies somewhere. Even, even if you believed in all the open border stuff, even if you believed that, you know, free flows of labor everywhere, uh, you know, you, those bodies come from somewhere else. They're creating labor shortage somewhere else. I mean, we are all interconnected to a degree. Um, you identified your, um, this is going to be even less sanguine uh, question than your talk, but um, you identified your sort of main interest in um, as have it preserving liberalism, small l liberalism, to hand down. And I'm just wondering to what extent you think that these demographic problems might be sort of inherent to the nature of liberalism, that, um, that uh, you know, this sort of the whole second democratic de demographic transition, that whole the mentality of individualism, I mean, that is basically what the theories of liberalism were from the beginning, seeing us all as independent actors. And somebody could say, well, the, the you know, it took a while in, in having that trickle down. There was a religious inheritance from the pre-liberal past, and but really this is the nature of liberalism to kill uh, fertility. Yes. Um, so we, we were talking about this last night, right on the way home. Uh, in, in his book on marriage, Jim Wilson basically fingers the enlightenment for the breakdown of, of religion. He says that... Uh, you know, once once you move into an, an enlightenment view of the world, it becomes you know, it becomes inevitable that you're going to view marriage as a contractual obligation. And once it is a contractual obligation, it can then be modified at will, and that then starts you down the path of you know fertility and child. Everything becomes so. I, 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 you know, if I thought about this hard for ten minutes, I might blame the enlightenment too. Um, but that isn't to say that there that there can't be a piece that we make on this. I mean, I. You know, I, I'm Catholic, and so I think that, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are ways. You look at Ilya II. I mean, you, you can be sort of a, a more faithful people, but also still believe in the Enlightenment stuff to a certain degree and believe in, in certain aspects of liberalism, and I'd say the big-ticket aspects, certainly, too. And, you know, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily need to go back to the Inquisition, um, although it might be nice. Uh, <laughs> But I, but I don't know, and this is so. This is the real question, you know. So when Longman asks about the return to, pa to the patriarchy, I mean, it, what he's suggesting is, and and what he was really getting at was not just NASCAR fan watchers, uh, but but like the real illiberal elements in in world society, right? Uh, you know, and frankly, like uh, like radical Islam. Um, now the good news is that you know <laughs> the good news, radical Islam. So I mean, the good news in all this is that uh, you know fertility rate. Good news. The good news, if that's your worry, is that the rates of fertility decline among Muslim countries are even steeper than they are in the world average. They're about forty percent steeper than they are for for the average rest of the world. Um, so it's going down. But you could see, you know, among like really orthodox sects of radical Islam, that could be a problem. And um, and you could again, if you were really going to like sit and pick your fingers over this, you could see like you know your way to Samuel Huntington class of civilization stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anna, did you have something? Um, yeah, vague, a vague question. Um, I, I don't really see how you'd ever get the, the level above replacement rate ever again unless there's, such, there's real economic pressure to do so. And by then, things would probably look pretty bad. I don't know, because the desire to have children. So my question is, how many people in your study have you encountered that unabashedly say, no children? No doubts about it, no children. My life is so good, or whatever, I'm not going to mess with it. Because it seems to me, I, I don't see how most people have a life that they just find so great. I mean, most people hate their jobs. <laughs> and I don't know, what, what is it that, that, is it hope, especially in America, to somehow still be achieving something? And then eventually, you, there, there's the window shoppers from Morse. Like, it seems to me that most people, ideally, especially if we go with like the more Swedish classes, they would want a child. You know, find the right partner, share the work, have maybe one kid, and satisfy that desire and and like prevent remorse right. later. So, but that's never ever going to solve the, the problem that you have. So even so, my question is: on the one hand, yeah, how many people actually do not want children, and what is it that makes that you've encountered that satis really satisfies them. And yeah, and, and the one child, that to me seems a plausible way to go, that's not gonna 
it's going to kind of help it all, like you said in the beginning. Right. So, so the 2.5 that is the same, the ideal fertility rate today, that's the same as it was in 1970. Uh, when you actually break it out, it's, it's composed of, a diff of very different things. Um, and so in 1970, there was a uh, smaller section of the populace that wanted zero or one kid and a larger section that wanted three or more. Uh, today, you have big growth in the zeros, you know, about 10 percent, big growth in the one out to about 10 percent, shrinkage in the three or more, but giant growth in two, and like giant, giant growth is so much that it becomes a, an overwhelming societal preference for two. Uh, now, the, the people who study this thought have always thought that uh, the sort of natural equilibrium will be for two that most people, you leave them to their own devices, will want two kids, and that that will wind up being the plurality preference for most societies. Um, but that turns out, we talked a little bit about this last night, um, that turns out to not always be the case. And so what you see is that ideal fertility, we think now, may be a normative uh, idea that re-anchors itself. Um, so we saw about eight years ago, for the first time, sub-replacement ideal fertility emerging in Europe, starting in Austria and Germany and spreading to Belgium uh, and Portugal, where even the ideal number has gone below two. And so the, the working theory on this, and it's just a working theory, is that what has happened is after being around very, very few children for a couple generations, society sort of ratchets down its idea of what ideal is because they see, oh, look at this, life can be pretty good without kids. Uh, and the, the number that jumped out at everybody in the, the last Eurobar study on this was uh, among German men asked about ideal, 23% said zero. Yeah, you know, which is, it is hard to see how you come back from that. Uh, now, as, as opposed to, what's interesting is in America, the I achieved fertility, so we're now at 18% of American women finish their childbearing years without kids. Another 18% finish their childbearing years with one. Uh, and those are, those are big growth numbers. Um, but again, what we're seeing is a lot of those people are underachieving their ideals, and they, they are not, you know, not hitting the targets they want. And to that extent, to the extent that they're not to the extent that they're underachieving their ideals, that's what concerns me, not that they're not having kids. If they don't want kids and are not having them, I say Godspeed. Um, but what worries me and what, what I do think we need to think about trying to make changes is for the people who want kids but wind up not getting them. And to that extent, I think, well, okay, we ought to look. So why didn't they, why didn't they hit their target? Uh, was it just bad luck or, you know, is like, the system set up? Uh, like just college, you know. So college affects, affects fertility in two ways. One, it imposes enormous prospective costs on what the kids cost you to raise. Two, it imposes uh, costs on you. You, know, you graduate from college carrying big debt burdens. People say uh, in surveys that they both postpone marriage and postpone childbearing because of student debt. Uh, but the, the really big thing is just temporally, right? So you don't, you know, so you graduate from college at 22, 23. Uh, let's say you want to go to medical school. So you now graduate from medical school, 27 or so, you do, uh, you do a residency, you do your internship, and you could be 32 years old before you could really even begin to think about family formation. And, and that's tough. I mean, that's, yeah, this is, these are the things I think we ought to think about. Anybody well, else? Um, with that, uh, th thinking about, <laughs> uh, it's two o'clock, we have to stop, and uh, we want to thank you for a very disturbing talk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much.